Good morning, campers, and welcome to Radio Camp Half Blood, a Percy Jackson read along podcast. I'm B, and I'm Zach. And this week we read chapter nineteen of the Titans Curse: The Gods Vote How to Kill Us. Hopefully, it wasn't unanimous. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe someone's gonna go for like a was it not a gangbuster? What's it called? Filibuster. Filibuster. There we go. Hopefully, Percy Jackson didn't ramble about his entire life story in this chapter because maybe the gods were trying to vote to kill them or something. I feel like Apollo would be the one to filibuster because he would just like start <laughs> reading poetry or something. They even like stop him from doing that in this in this chapter. I can't believe we're in the second to last chapter already, but at the same time, we've been reading this for a while, so maybe <laughs> it's not already like it's it's spring now, and we started reading this around like Christmas time, right? <laughs> well, luckily, B, by the time we finish with this thing, you can put down your Christmas decorations and put them right back up. Yeah, seriously. Well, no, actually not true, but yeah, we're heading into summer, but in Percy Jackson world, it's almost Christmas time. <laughs> I think it pretty much is Christmas. It is. Well, it's the solstice, so it's like like the 20, I want to say the 21st. is. When is the solstice? Why can't we have like a Christmas special where Percy Jackson saves Christmas? He does wrestle Santa, who's not really Santa. No, he fights a mythical homeless person, so close enough, I guess. It sort of looks like Santa. There's a, a few allusions to the holiday season in this uh, this book, but not really... I keep forgetting like what time of year it takes place because I'm so used to these books taking place during the summer. Well, yes, because the cool thing about summer is it's so like pretty much is just three or four seasons of just being hot and miserable where, you know, you can kind of forget the month, whereas Titan's Curse takes place within a couple days. Same as with most of the Percy Jackson books. They take place between like a week or so because the first one is about seven to 12 days. The other one is a couple days and this one is a couple days. So we have a trend here of like very, very short time frames. I guess that's because uh, Rick Riordan wants the readers to feel the stakes almost of having that clock. Because one thing that I've noticed, especially rereading these books, is that this isn't even like a trope. This is just how the tension is. I'm not sure if it's something that Rick Riordan changes later on, but it's pretty much, oh, no, we have to get there. Luckily, we have plenty of time. Oh, no, we only have 10 minutes before the thing happens. Oh, hopefully we win. It's always like to like the last minute. It always makes you think of how um like you know in in the Netflix unfortunate events. I think it's like in the bad beginning, I want to say, when like Olaf has like the uh, the hourglass and he like flips it around but then it doesn't work and then he's like oh I've got it online. And that's kind of like he's making fun of that trope a little bit, like the oh the ticking clock we have to make it in time to whatever and it's like you're your mental picture is sort of cutting back to like the clock, like, oh, we only have this amount of time to get to the meeting of the god. Like, this is really everything has been counting down to this scene because they needed to get Artemis to the meeting of the gods in time. There's like a lot of, I don't know, weird art, and maybe not arbitrary, but it feels sort of narratively like, oh, we need to have like this countdown that's really important. But it's it's obviously just to add stakes to what's happening. So the way I'm looking at this is I've been rereading a lot of Goosebumps books, and that is to a like a middle grade to young adult audience, you need to have a page turner of a book. So by setting it within those stakes, a kid will constantly keep reading and feel like they're like really plowing through that book when really like there, it has like a very like a much smaller word count than the books I'm so used to. I'm like, wow, this book's going by like stupidly fast. And then I realize, oh, that's why, because you, you want to turn the page rather than be stuck listening to six characters talk about like semantics and politics and whatever in between. Yeah. Though it is funny because this the book doesn't feel fast. Then again, we have been reading it in, in like a bizarre way of stretching it out over months and months. So like that's not how most people would be reading this book. No, the way that most people be reading this is an example is in the first book when Percy falls off the gateway arch. Kids will be instantly want to read the next ch- couple chapters of that. Yeah. And some of them are like really short and then some of them are very long. And that's one of the great beauties about this is I like the idea of stakes in Percy Jackson, especially in a like a hero thing where you need to always have kind of like that ticking clock where Percy Jackson can just be like, you know what, maybe I might go to the store today. And he's like looking at like, oh, should I get this yogurt or should I get this one with blueberries in it when like they have all the time in the world rather than, oh, yeah, we have to cut out like the crud. We have to like get across the United States within four days, which to a kid sounds nearly impossible. Yeah. Though at the same time, I think kids have like a a different perception of time where like four days seems much longer than maybe to you or I. 
Oh yeah, now for me it's like, uh, make it stop. Four days it just went by. Uh, make it stop. Yeah, I guess it depends on your job. Like four days can seem like forever. Four days, more like four hours. Am I right? Well, there's one more chapter left, and I'm I'm trying to think. Like, there's something serious that's probably going to happen because we end. Well, we'll get into it, but it it sort of ends on this weird note. I would call this chapter, it de-escalates very quickly of what you think it's going to be. And then it slowly becomes like, I like to call it like the Lord of the Rings Return of the King ending, where there's like separate endings to this chapter. Like, oh, you could just end the book right here or here or here. It's strange because there also is like a couple like crazy uh, plot, well, not plot twists, but I mean, literally Poseidon turns to Percy and he's like, yeah, Luke's not dead. (laughs) Which, like, isn't that surprising, because we've talked about this, that I didn't think that he was dead, but... Um, I wouldn't call them plot twists, I would call them revelations. Yeah, like, he, it's, like, confirmed, because before it was just, you know, Annabeth with her instinct, and also, like, you can't really trust Annabeth, because, of course, she would want Luke to be alive, because she has complicated feelings about him, and blah, blah, blah. But that would be, like, such a weird place to end, I think. <laughs> They're just like, anyway, let's have a party. Luke's alive. So this chapter kind of opens up with them flying to Mount Olympus and the way they have it is it's a total ghost town because everyone's going to the big events of the big game, if you will, of like this huge meeting of the gods and Percy Jackson like breaks in at the last moment with Artemis and they're like, oh, this is this is really awkward. Hey, guys, how you guys doing today? And like, yeah, so we're going to be having a vote if we should uh, kill well, you Artemis guys. Artemis is already there because she went ahead. Right? Well, yeah, she did go ahead. But that's like that's the awkward part. Of, like, oh, Artemis got here first and. We're going to talk about killing you guys. It's like that, that Emperor's New Groove thing where it's like, wait, how did they get here first? By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I like the whole meeting of the gods. I think this is probably my favorite segments in all of the Percy Jackson books is when it's Percy, after dealing with a whole ton of BS, is kind of like face to face with the people that are like are the cause of everything. And it's always unique. Yeah, well, not the cause of everything, but certainly have contributed well i mean they're the they're a symptom yeah well i mean yes you could technically argue that the titans wouldn't be wanting to destroy everything if it weren't for the gods but like there's other you know let's not blame them (laughs) we're also dealing with like gray level characters here because we talk about killing children we talk about murdering innocent animals we talk about just like the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few Yeah, it's like a pretty weird dark scene, honestly, because I kind of just expected, I don't know why I thought this, but I thought most of the gods would be like, yeah, you did a good job. And Artemis, surprisingly, is like, yeah, Percy did a good job. I'm really proud of him and he deserves an award. And like, that's saying something because she wasn't super keen on him in the beginning. Well, that's like her own very special brand of misandry where she doesn't like dudes also, but... See, in my head, what I'm thinking about is like, oh, Thalia, do you want to be my lieutenant? And then she turns to Percy Jackson, and here you go. Here's a banana sticker. Good job. <laughs> here you go, Sunny. Yeah, it's like a star that you'd get on the top of your spelling quiz. Oh, yeah, no, it's like I'm a good noodle, like in SpongeBob. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, he seems like pretty stoked to like get that acknowledgement. But then, like, there's some gods who uh, who aren't so sympathetic to Percy and, and Talia, for that matter. Obviously, their respective parents defend them because, duh, like, the Zeus is going to be like, don't murder my daughter for the sake of preventing this prophecy from happening. And then same thing with uh, Poseidon. Well, it's more like, don't murder my daughter, dot, 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 again, question mark? Yeah, well, she wasn't quite murdered, but. You know, also that's different because she was like going to be murdered. And then he's the one who actually suspends her into a tree. Anyway, that we're getting sidetracked. But <laughs> what this kind of does is kind of sets up the, the stakes a little bit here of just having, hey, should we murder these kids? But it's coming from the wisest person that there is, which is Athena. She's the one that proposed this idea, which, you know, it's like poetry. It rhymes with having... In the beginning of The Lightning Thief, we have Annabeth hating Percy, and they kind of find their understanding. But of course, Poseidon and Athena aren't going to be the same way as their kids. Yeah, it's kind of like Percy gets a little offended that Athena is so quick to be like, I don't know, maybe we should kill these children because they're they're trouble. And then, I mean, honestly, I think this is kind of a clever 
solution. I mean, it's not a complete solution, actually, because we'll, we'll talk about how Percy could still fulfill the prophecy. But Talia's like, yep, I'm going to be uh, a hunter now, so I won't ever turn 16. So, like, there's no way she could ever fulfill the, fulfill the prophecy, even if she did kill Bessie it wouldn't be the prophecy fulfilled, which is kind of like a, a clever solution to that. I kind of am not super surprised that she became a hunter because that's been like her arc throughout all of this is sort of reconciling her weird, not hatred of the hunters because I think it wasn't like that extreme, but sort of she had animosity towards them and th- saw them as like, you know, against the camp somehow. Um, and especially her bickering with Zoe. I kind of see it as the Captain America syndrome of, uh, because she's so out of time. Like, oh, why didn't she join the people that are totally out of time? So it doesn't seem like she's like technically aging or this is her character progression is, is that she is pretty much going to be timeless. Yeah, it like makes a lot of sense in a way because we've also been grappling a little bit with how she doesn't feel at home or I guess normal after what happened to her with like the tree. Like she's not aged in a normal way already. She's not, you know, everything's arrested in time for her. So it it makes a lot of sense for her to just go back to that kind of thing and be like, oh, I'm never going to age. But that's like, I'm used to that in a way. (laughs) Well, she was kind of aging. I don't remember exactly how the tree thing works. Like she ages slower or something or. Yep. And I'm going to stay in my ways. Bye bye, Percy Jackson. I got to yeet out of here. That's never going to age. The one interesting aspect that I found about this chapter as well is you have the person which is, you know, Athena, who's pretty much being like, hey, everyone, you need to kind of kill Percy Jackson. But yet at the Hoover Dam, it may or may not have been her to help Percy. If it wasn't for him, he wouldn't have gotten Annabeth and so on and so forth. Exactly. Like they needed Percy to help Annabeth and everything that happened towards the end of the book. So it wouldn't have made sense for her to be like, I'm going to kill him now to prevent the prophecy like that. She would also like, I think that as pragmatic as Athena is when it comes to killing Percy, like, oh, well, it would probably be better for all of us to kill him because it would prevent this from happening to begin with. And as long as he's alive, he's a threat, that kind of thing. But she wouldn't just do it. She'd talk about it first with the other gods. Like, she's not evil. Really? I feel like she'd be the type of person that would just pull out a gun and shoot him. <laughs> do you really think that or you're just messing with me? Well, no. If she's doing something for the greater good, because in her mind, she's the s- smartest person in the world. But, like, I understand, like, you know, there's ancient rules protecting this because then Athena and Poseidon would go at it. But if it looked like an accident, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Because if she was just going to kill him, regardless of what other people thought, then everyone would be like, well, I vote to keep him alive. And then she would have just killed him anyway. Like, (laughs) do you know what I'm saying? Well, especially with the gods and kind of Greek culture, you know, it's kind of the birthplace or the stepping stones of democracy. So, of course, they're going to vote on certain aspects. Right. Which is interesting because like a lot of the gods have contrasting interests in mind but they still vote like they don't ever i mean sometimes they go against um the other gods but for the most part they're supposed to be in harmony with each other which kind of speaks also to the whole agreement about how the big three aren't supposed to have kids it's like this this tenuous agreement where they're not really friends and they don't really get along but they say that they'll follow these certain rules because they're all so powerful if they didn't follow some sort of rule set then everything would be chaos well, here's the thing, though. You have to keep in mind that they're all related, and it's kind of like bickering with your family playing Monopoly. Like, you do get along, but they're still you're all still separate people. Like, even, like, twins don't really have the same personality. It isn't yeah, like, I know. come play with us, Danny. Can we just talk for a second about how Athena calls Poseidon her uncle? And that just makes the whole Annabeth Percy thing, like, so weird. Just super weird, you guys. Like, I get it. Yes, it, I get it's supposed to be different. Like, they're not technically related. It's gods. It's like a different thing. It still super weirds me out. It It's super icky. It's brought to my attention a lot in this chapter because she's like, and my father, Zeus. And I'm like, wait, what? So in my honest opinion, I feel like this is not even like a whole jab at the fans, but it's like. I think some people are just in denial and trying to come up with rational explanations for certain things. I'm sure I'm, I know in my heart of hearts that Rick Riordan talks about this, but still like if you think about it too hard, it goes into super creepy. Even if it's like they're not technically related, it's still just like the s- system that's set up is kind of like, uh, no, you gotta crush it. Okay. So wait, if Poseidon is Athena's uncle, 
Let's get this together. Then that makes that Annabeth's great uncle. See, the way I'm looking at See, the way that I look at this is the same way as George Lucas in Star Wars. It's like, oh, well, you see, Leia's going to kiss Luke. And then in Empire Strikes Back, uh, Leia's going to kiss uh, Luke. And then in, uh, oh, oh, no, I'm going to make her um, Luke's sister. Yes. Oh, no, they're related. <laughs> yeah, they're like, whoops, right. Yes. Okay. But from the beginning, we've understood that they're related. So it's just, oh, it's so weird. It's super, uh, I don't, I'm trouble. Well, okay. How are Percy and Annabeth related? They're related they're like second cousins or something or like okay so i guess it's less creepy i guess i'm doing like a shrug right now it's still weird i don't know it's it weirds me out in a way where it's like yes okay i don't know we could harp on this forever and i don't exactly know like maybe they explain it away at some point but in this specific chapter it really became apparent to me i was like oh this is so creepy so there's one other thing that i've kind of been thinking about recently it's kind of like the idea of like they even talk about really in this chapter about like a kid's relationship and an adult relationship. I think we're thinking about this in adult relationship terms rather than like kids. You don't have to think about it too hard because they're not doing anything graphic. I guess, but like, even if you want it, like they have kissed though, which like, okay. Yeah. We're not talking about like a good old fashioned, like down at the Lannisters. We're talking about like gods and weird beings and, it's like the second you put like a goat boy in the story, you're like, well, um, anything's possible. We also have a cow serpent, so anything's even more possible. But it's one of those things where I see, I really wish this Rick would just write an article about this. I know, I think he, he writes it in, I think, the next book or the book after that, talking about it more specifically. But you can see where like it's really weird and creepy no matter what you do. But like, there's like really hardly any way to defend it other than it. it I think it's explained later on. I know that like the Percy Beth Shepherds are going to be like, no, there's a reason why it's fine. And like what I'm not judging you like because I it's it's different than like humans, but it still just squicks me out just a little bit. And that's just me and my personal journey. Yeah, let's like let's move on a little bit. I feel like we're getting too close to Lannisport. Too bogged down with details. Yeah, uh, but the one thing that I thought was so noticeable is that like. Athena kind of like smack talks Zeus and Poseidon. Like even Hades is the most honorable person here, and he's kept his bargain. Yeah, she does throw shade just a little bit, um, like but passive aggressively in a very classy Athena sort of way, where she's like, "Yeah, it's funny, you know, Hades is the one guy who hasn't uh, messed this one up, huh?" So in my head, what I'm thinking about is that she either has like a mid Atlantic vo- like speaking voice, <laughs> or. She's just Maggie Smith and Clash of the Titans. I haven't seen Clash of the Titans, actually. But Maggie Smith is very great. Well, yeah, she's in Clash of the Titans, the original one with Ray Harryhausen. She's Athena. Yeah, just I could I could picture her just being like real, real passive aggressive. Like, yeah, anyway, um, you guys uh didn't keep to this very basic promise that uh you weren't supposed to do this because uh, you know, could bring about the end of our Life as we know it. And here Poseidon was, I saw the Great Pyramids and I got thirsty. Yeah, that's what happened. That's <laughs> that's what happened with Zeus and with, with Poseidon. Um, and they had kids. Well, okay, so basically what happens is Talia and Percy are still technically eligible to be a part of the prophecy when the chapter starts. Yes, it's pretty much like inevitable right now because, you know, they have this prophecy and there's Obviously, it's a process of elimination. You get rid of the two people that may or may not be ending the world, and maybe you solve the problem, or maybe you've made it worse. Then again, also, these are the children of the big three that we know of, because I don't know. I don't trust these gods. Who knows who's out there? But as of right now, we've narrowed it down. I'm just like imagining like Percy Jackson, both like an evil mustache. It's Ursi. Or no, wouldn't it be like they just they reverse the the P to a B? It's it's Bercy. Bercy Baxter. Bercy faction. Your brother. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's it's not out of the realm of the possibility that there are other children out there. But as of now, it's just Percy who can fulfill the prophecy because Talia, who seemed to be the front runner as far as um who was gonna fulfill this thing, 
she can't because of the whole Hunters of Artemis thing. She, like, her whole character arc, she forgives the Hunters of Artemis and her weird thing with, like, hating Zoe she got over. And now she wants to be a hunter because she feels, like, more at home, not aging and blah, 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 weird tree trauma, etc. We also have the moment where Percy thinks that Artemis is talking to Annabeth about this. And he's like, oh, no, don't do this. And he has, like, this acute, adorable moment where he's just, like, this is, like, a regular kid thing of just being, like, you're afraid that your friend's going to, I guess, get a promotion or something, and you're just afraid. You, you know when you're when you're 11? No, whatever. You know when you're 13 and your friend is going to get a promotion and move away? <laughs> you know that universal kid feeling? No, here's the philosophy. It's, like, your, your friend is going to be moving to a different classroom, like, after the graduate for the next grade it's the exact same thing it's like the same type of irrational fear yeah and it i think especially because it was sort of real that she was sort of being courted by the hundreds of artemis before that like it was within within the realm of possibility that she would be asked to be a hunter again but again i think that the reason that she's not a hunter is because she wants to be with percy that's like kind of the the hint that we're getting that that's part of the reason why she hasn't already pledged her whatever her loyalty to artemis um but talia she's like yeah i can't do this anymore i'm trying to be a person and i can't because i was like a tree for a while everything's weird it would be easier if i didn't age also helpful because she's going to turn 16 in like a day and then could bring about the end of society as we know it so it's it's helpful for her to not age here she is rooted to the ground she's like you know what i gotta i gotta make like a tree and get out of here yeah that's exactly what she says I feel like if she would do anything, she'd have, like, terrible, terrible, terrible tree puns. Yeah. But, no, I like the idea of that she kind of, like, makes her own, like, destiny in this respect of being able to, like, you know what? After this prophecy, I kind of want to live my life and not get worried about being killed. So I'm going to take myself completely out of this equation without, like, jumping off Mount Olympus. But Percy can't be a hunter, so that that cop-out isn't available to him even if he wanted to do that. Um, So he's, like, the only one left. Again, he's... Hold on. They mention his age here. He's 14. He's got two years. 14. He has two... Yeah, he's 14 now. Oh, man, he's going to start having to shave soon, and his his voice, for some reason... I know he was, like, 13 last year, but I still think, like, he has, like, a squeaky voice, and he's got pimples, and... yeah. Oh, everyone's a mess when they're 14. I think that, no offense to anybody who's listening who's 14, I was also a mess. I continue to be a mess when I'm 25, but a different kind of one. Yeah, I like how he says, oh, well, we have two more years, and then Athena just immediately busts in with the truth bomb and is like, yeah, two years for Cronus to deceive you, which, you know, offensive, but true. Well, yeah, because it's the idea of, like, temptation. Like, well, two years can change a person, like, dramatically. Like, I know, like, people, like, two years out of high school, like, they've kind of, like, gotten their lives more figured out. They're either, like, you know, having kids, getting ma- This is This is just me. Having kids, getting married, becoming a Laker. Like, things like stupid things that happen. Yeah, and I think um, this exchange really sums up why Athena feels the way she does. She says, much can change in two years, my young hero. It is only the truth, child. It is bad strategy to keep the animal alive or the boy. So again, we have to remember she's the goddess of strategy. So she is thinking things through. Like she doesn't really think with her heart so much as she thinks with her mind. And she understands that, yes, as much as you like this Percy boy, uh, if he lives for another two years and then fulfills this prophecy, then we're all kind of... Uh, up a creek a little bit i just thought of something so stupid that i know it wouldn't be true but why don't they like turn them like 17 because they have god powers after all or maybe turn percy into like a dog so he ages in dog years really quickly so he's already too old to meet the prophecy you mean because he's a dog like the time he got turned into a hamster remember that time oh yeah or maybe maybe that actually altered his age for a little bit who knows yeah i mean i don't know if they can change your age They could change maybe how old you look, but your age is your age. Like, there isn't anything bad about, like, trying to change your destiny. But, you know, when you're trying to change your destiny, destiny will kind of push back in one way, shape, or form. Yeah, that's the lesson of every That's So Raven episode. Well, especially be because Percy Jackson's name is on the book. Yes, that's true. That would be awkward if he died, too. Because, like, what what would you call the series? Annabeth Chase and the winners of Kick-Ass-Dom. Annabeth Chase and the dead friends. 
Oh, yeah, and I just imagine, like, Percy dies and Annabeth, like, makes him into, like, a, like, a puppet. Like, it's, like, Weekend at Bernie's type of book. I'd love that, actually. Take that back. No. We we talk about Weekend at Bernie's way too much for a Percy Jackson podcast. Wouldn't that be, like, great? Or, like, the arm scene in, like, Toy Story. Look, there's Percy right here. Hi, guys. And he's just dead. We also talk about that scene a lot, too. It's It's kind of... It's kind of a, a touchstone of ours. But I kind of like that they kind of like shift focus to like, okay, fine, we're not going to kill you guys, but we have to really decide about Bessie. Should we kill her? I think we should like barbecue her. Half snake meat, half a bull, maybe some surf and turf type of situation here. Yeah, Percy says controlling the prophecies never works. Isn't that true? Besides Bess, Be- the Ophir Taurus is innocent, killing something that is like that is wrong it's just as wrong as as chronos eating his children just because of something they might do it's wrong which i mean props to percy for for pulling that one out because that's a that's like a good point well it's the same as with like in harry potter with like the idea of like sucking unicorn blood like if you suck it you're gonna have bad luck and you're gonna live like a very cursed life the exact same type of thing like you kill someone that's innocent like a mockingbird it's like a sin to kill a mockingbird because all it does is make song I think that's probably why the prophecy is fulfilled when you kill the Ophiotaurus is because it's something to do with, like, killing something innocent. But, like, I think I talked about this last episode. If they kill it, then the prophecy isn't fulfilled because it has to be the person who's turning 16. Is that correct? So the way I'm looking at this is that's not necessarily what it could be. This could be one attributing factor. There could be other things that happen. But primarily, if someone were to kill Bessie and throw their organs into a fire, uh, pretty much they could have like a nuke almost right you'd also have to um sacrifice or like whatever offer up the entrails or something that's like a, an important part yeah you have to throw the organs yeah. yeah so well it's the same as with you have to that's just greek culture in general that's the main reason why like odysseus in the odyssey kind of gets like screwed over is because he doesn't provide a sacrifice to poseidon so poseidon puts him on odysseus's excellent journey which wasn't so excellent it was more bogus <laughs> more bogus yeah so i guess yeah that's the preemptive thing is if you kill it so they, if they kill the ovio Taurus, it's not like they're fulfilling the prophecy also because uh none of the big three children are 16 yet so it, ha- it has to be to the letter exactly what the the oracle says we have to also bear in mind that like the entire concept of the prophecy is that it's not always what you think it is. Uh, like, the language is very specific, right? Like, it could mean something different than what you think. So, like, there's a lot of, like, weird loopholes that it, it's not necessarily going to go down the way you think it's going to go down. For instance, we all thought that it was going to be Talia, but if she's not going to be 16, it's, like, physically impossible for her to fulfill this. So it has to be Percy. Yeah, that's what that's what you thought. Yeah. Then again, I, I read this book series, so it's like... Uh, yeah, yeah, it is Thalia. Yeah, that's true. I mean, like, I thought it was him, or I, I, I thought it was, it was her. I thought it was probably gonna be Talia, and then they would figure out a way to get out of it, but then, obviously, we're left with, with Percy, and then he could also. So, I, I, it's really, you can get into, like, really circular conversations where you're like, oh, is, like, was the prophecy always predicting a specific person, or does it change depending on the circumstances? Like, oh, they, like, kind of blocked that prophecy from happening in regards to Talia because she can't be 16, so then now it has to be Percy, or was it always him? Like, it's kind of like this weird thing of, like, is fate always set in stone, or it's, it's like, a very confusing thing to think about well this is more like terminator 2 to terminator 3 where terminator 2 is like you can make fate to be anything then terminator 3 is like ah eh, screw that it's destiny set in stone judgment day is gonna happen no matter what you do yeah so it's like uh, is this all for nothing because i mean even percy is saying like oh you can't really change this like you can you can prevent it from happening now maybe Yes and no. There's like, it's one of those things where you just have to like wait until it happens type of situation. Like, obviously, it's like one of those silly things of saying, oh, it's never going to happen because we still got two books and a lot could happen in that time of two years. But I think the most important thing is, is that they have like this huge debate about Bessie. Like, should we kill it? Should we not? And they kind of end up deciding, you know what? We're going to we're going to let it live, but we're going to. We have to keep it somewhere safe where no one's going to take it, kind of like the Ark of the Covenant. Like, we don't want those pesky Nazis getting that Ark of the Covenant anymore. Has it ever worked where they've 
try to prevent a prophecy from happening because that's not really a thing. Like you can't you can't do that, right? Like it's kind of funny to me that the gods are like, "Oh, well if we just do this then we can prevent this from happening." But like it is a prophecy. It's going to happen. Maybe not in the way that you thought because you're preventing it from happening a different way. But I I mean, we just know from what the prophecy is saying that, okay, so someone's just going to steal the Ophiotaurus and kill it. And if it's not going to be Percy for some reason, then it's going to be another child of the big three that we don't know about. And it's going to happen. And then that's what the climax of this entire series is going to be like is some person who's the chosen one to do this and bring about the the fall of the gods and the rise of the titans like that's gonna happen one way or another right what i'm gonna say about this b is did you ever watch any of the final destination movies uh i know the premise but i haven't seen them because i don't want to have nightmares okay so people that don't know horror movies where in the beginning of the movie a group of teenagers either going on a trip or something one of them gets a deathly premonition of what's going to happen to them all dying and they prevent them from dying. So what happens is death still needs to kill them. They die in like weird, wacky ways. So it's kind of like destiny kind of correcting itself. You can prevent something, possibly. Though, will the universe let it happen? Willingly. I don't think so. I just like, it It just seems sort of fruitless to do something like this. So it's it just funny to me that like any of the gods would be like, even if they did kill the Ophiotaurus and prevented it, that way then there would be like another Ophiotaurus or something like there would be some oh do you think it's gonna like respawn <laughs> like a video game yeah I mean got also yeah animals re- or whatever monsters respawn right like we've talked about this and I just feel like there's no way to prevent this from happening because it's in a an- prophecy and what we- doesn't necessarily means that the Ophiotaurus is the like be all end all is the monster yeah exactly like it could be a different monster that fulfills like i don't remember exactly what the prophecy says like exactly well i can't tell you because then i'll accidentally say something yeah probably you will but that's what i'm saying i just i don't think any of this is going to work out but they do come up with a good solution of we're going to keep it on mount olympus but we're going to put it in an aquarium that always works right keeping the all-powerful thing just hidden away like it never gets stolen oh just an arm's reach uh huh. Definitely never gets stolen and never gets misused by the the bad people that we've. I mean, look at Zeus's lightning bolt. Ha 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 ha. Uh huh. Yeah. You can't. If you could steal Zeus's lightning bolt, you could steal anything. I'm always imagining the vine of the person like trying to do like uh, security at the I guess football event where he's kind of like waving his hands over the person like an old guy. That's what I'm thinking about here. It's like security in Mount Olympus. It's just this guy. Like, eh, you're good. Just some guy. Yeah. And then I'm just imagining like. Kronos just like strolling up there like yep like 30 do skidooing it up there like he has got like his pocket watch out like twirling it it doesn't make any sense to me what I think this is gonna work out it definitely doesn't feel to me like it's gonna work out uh but pretty much what ends up happening is that everyone saves the day uh they're gonna solve this for another time they buy time is basically what they do well yes and we find out that they have this huge like dance party which is really funny yeah, have you ever been to um, a silent dance party before? I've been to a silent disco before. Yeah, same, yeah, whatever, same idea. Like, basically, the, the premise, for those who don't know, is, like, you listen to something. Like, usually it's a synced playlist, so, like, everyone starts their playlist at the same time, and you're all dancing to the same thing, but no one outside of the headphones obviously can hear. So, like, if you were to take off the headphones, it would just be, like, a bunch of people sort of shuffling and dancing to nothing, but you put on the headphones and we're all dancing to the same song. But it, it's sort of the similar idea where um, it's, like, whatever you, music you want to hear. So everyone's dancing, but it's actually, it's whatever they want to hear, so they're not arguing about different types of music, which makes sense because parents and children infamously fight about that kind of thing. All I know is that Poseidon was probably rocking out to Baby Shark. Was he? You think? You think in the early 2000s? I'm sure he's the one that invented that song. He invented that song. An an age-old, beautiful song. The song of my people. Baby. (laughs) (laughs) No, see, this is what I'm thinking about. Like, imagine like 90 years from now when there's like an old couple and they're like listening. This is the song that we fell in love to, and they just hear baby shark do 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 baby shark do 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 and they're like crying, like holding hands. Uh, but I like all the premonitions that kind of come forth with, like, you know, they vote not to kill them. And Percy's kind of like hanging back and Poseidon comes and visits him for the second time in the series. And once again, I love the idea of like gray level characters, especially gods, because the way they've 
proven gods in this world, in this universe, is that they're very flawed individuals that aren't really, you know, all powerful and are all seeing and all wise. Like, they all make mistakes and do things. And this is kind of the Percy and Poseidon scene where it's kind of like, yeah, well, I, I messed up once again. Sorry, son. I guess we can't play the old pigskin today. Yeah, which we kind of knew, right? <laughs> and we know, we, we kind of find out that Luke is not dead. He somehow survived his 80 foot fall where his body is all crumpled. Like, I'm imagining, like, best case scenario, he's a vegetable for the rest of his life. Worst case scenario is, is that he's really angry. He's going to have a bigger scar on his face now. He's still alive, which, again, I mean, there's a few reasons why we thought that was the case. I just had a feeling he was still alive because, like, he's kind of one of the main antagonists that would be weird the way he died just didn't seem like the last of him uh then annabeth is like yeah i don't think he's dead either and then besides like yeah by the way he's still alive and then it's weird because percy's then like okay how, but how did he survive that though he looked definitely dead and then besides like yeah i don't know but he seems mad and just imagine like post credit scene like he's like in an operating room and they're like putting robot parts on him so he's cyber luke and he, his eye opens up and he has like a red glowy eye. I don't truly understand how he could have survived that. Well, I guess anything's possible because a wizard did it. I just wish that there was like a better explanation. I hope that that better explanation comes as to why the Frick Frack he's still alive. Because like what he was what the hickety hack? literally ground beef on the ground. <laughs> like it's it wasn't good. Like I said, best case scenario, he's a vegetable. Worst case scenario, he's like evilly pissed off. Which he is. That's what Poseidon says. Um, thanks, Poseidon, for revealing that one. He's like, BT dubs. He says it kind of nonchalantly. Well, I mean, what else are you going to say? Like, because last book they had, you know, Brace Yourself, and that was for Thalia. That's true. Yeah, he's not the best at communicating in a normal way. No, he just sends the life force of Luke, and he's just like, oh, no, this is bad. Hey, son, uh, remember your friend that tried to kill you multiple times? Well, he's still kind of alive. Yeah, it's awkward because he calls him friend at first, and then he's like, yeah, not my friend. He has been evil for a while now. After Poseidon kind of leaves, we kind of find out that Athena's like, yeah, maybe you should also be dead because she's also hanging out there. I feel like she's like the evil chaperone of this dance. She's just there. She doesn't want to be there. Yeah. Leave some room for Zeus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it turns out that we actually learned about Percy's fatal flaw, which... I'm not sure. Did did you call it? Because um... I'm not sure. I feel like I must have said something like this because I did say, I think a few episodes ago, something about how every book so far has been about him rescuing somebody that he cares about. So like pretty obvious in some ways because it's like the main driving force of all of these books so far is him helping his friends or his loved ones like his mom. I might have accidentally slipped in saying it, I think, before. But yeah, that's pretty much so his fatal flaw is is that he kind of relies on his friends. Like, they're his, like, source of power. Yeah, his his loyalty, right? Like, I think that's what Athena says, which, yeah, okay. I'm, I don't even know if I guess that necessarily or if it's just, like, so obvious I didn't even guess it. Because, like, that's an obvious trait of Percy. That's his main personality trait is that he cares about his friends. He'll do anything for his friends. He'll hold up the world for his friends. He'll go and find the sea of monsters like it, there's a anything he'll do for his his friends or his family he'll go to the underworld and back just to protect his mom yep yeah so definitely uh makes sense there i it's not so much like a plot twist when she says that it's more just like oh yeah and to a, like a younger reader i maybe they may not have been able to predict that there's just like things that you see throughout the series but now we kind of just get it flatly stated that you know it's loyalty and you know it, he's greater than numbers percy jackson the second he's alone you know he kind of falters because he doesn't have anything to really fight for but now that he knows his fatal flaw maybe he can work on it a little bit maybe not we'll, we'll find out later on it's interesting because we've talked about how annabeth's fatal flaw is hubris no it's hummus no, your your fatal flaw is hummus. <laughs> I hate hummus. Exactly. Your fatal flaw is your hatred of hummus. One of our new videos is going to be, what what's Zach and B's fatal flaw? And just like, anxiety. Ang both of, that's both of ours. <laughs> 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 that's called being a millennial. Um, anyway, Annabeth's flaw is obviously pride because we've talked about this before but i do think that to some extent her she's 
loyal too because the reason that she gets trapped under the weight of the world is because she wants to help Luke and that's definitely a loyalty problem. So they're they're not too dissimilar. Like I I wouldn't say that just because the capital F capital F fatal flaw of uh Percy and Annabeth are respectively uh loyalty and hubris because they're they both have those problems too. Like he also has an issue with sort of being uh over overly prideful sometimes and she has an issue with being overly loyal to people that maybe she shouldn't be loyal to. So the thing about fatal flaws is it's a, a lot like the Achilles heel to a person like they might be indestructible but this one thing is what makes them human. Yeah, but again, it's like that's not also what, how people are or I mean I guess they're demigods so not technically people, but you understand what I'm saying like people are complicated so they might have more than one flaw. Like I think Percy does have an issue also with like maybe being a little bit too hard-headed and then Annabeth is I mean her loyalty to Luke has like gotten them in a lot of trouble sometimes. Yeah, most certainly, especially with uh, with the sirens and Annabeth jumping overboard. Yeah, right, exactly. Because that was bold. Like, in that scenario, she's like, oh, that my fatal flaw is hubris. That's why I was, like, called by the sirens because I... But it wasn't just, like, the buildings that she would have created. That's That wasn't the only thing that she sees in the Sea of Monsters. She also sees Luke. So that's, you know, that's kind of both, right? It's her also being like, oh, it's my my friend who I believe I can save, which I guess mm, it's complicated because then it's like, oh, the hubris of thinking that you can save people. Well, yeah, it's the philosophy of Annabeth is like, I can save the city and get the girl at the same time. Yeah. Or get the the completely destroyed, sad man baby. <laughs> <sighs> but yeah, so what ends up happening is, you know, Athena leaves, Percy's kind of indifferent and then they have like this weird silent disco and Annabeth kind of shows up and they kind of do their, you know, this is where all the fan fictioners and the shippers, you know, get out their keyboards and talk about how. And start tap tapping away. Yeah, tap 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 it away. And Percy's like, I offered you that dance. I was going to say that I love you, but why don't we, we go for that dance? Yeah, because um, so this was um, when he thought that she was going to be uh a hunter of Artemis. He was like, wait, no, wait, don't. I, I love you. Uh, well, he's obviously trying to say that when awkwardly Artemis is like, actually, <laughs> Talia. And then he's like, oh, never mind. But then she asks him later, like, oh, so what were you trying to say? And he's like, uh, but the, the dance, please. I am awkward and 14. I'm just imagining Annabeth like, well, that's really out of context. You wanted to, to dance after? That's what you wanted to? Yeah, it doesn't. Don't make sense, obviously, but she just kind of like believes it because I think, I mean, let's be fair, Annabeth is the child of the god of wisdom, so I think she knows what's happening. She just like lets Percy do his thing. It's like, yeah, I know, I kind of know what you were gonna say, but I'm not gonna like call you out on it, kind of thing. No, so they end up having like a, a like a slow dance, which oh, thinking of the scene, I thought of the most random song that actually fits perfectly. Uh, with the scene, what song did you have? Because I feel like everyone's going to have a different interpretation of a slow dance. Basically, he says that he doesn't know what other people are hearing, but he hears like a, a slow a slow song that's like sad but kind of hopeful. So I don't know what that would be. I don't know. Don't you forget about me? <laughs> well, you don't have a song that you thought about? Also, I keep thinking about how the uh, last season of Stranger Things ended with a slow dance of... um. I'll be watching you, which is kind of both, like, supposed to be cute, but also it's creepy. Well, that's, like, the stereotypical one that I think about. But also it's, like, for me, this is the most random one and this popped into my head. And I don't know why, B. But uh, it's also a cover of a song, which is even weirder. The song, I think we're alone now. Wait, who originally, is that, is that Tiffany? Is that a Tiffany song? Yes, I'm talking about Tiffany, yeah. <laughs> why do I know that? <laughs> I'm not even, like, of the generation that should know that. Well, no, I don't even know why it popped into my head. I might have heard that song once. And she does the hand dancing? You know, I'm thinking of, like, the way I'm thinking about her is that she, like, toured malls, like, very much like uh, Robin Sparkles and How I Met Your Mother. No, that's, like, literally what Robin Sparkles is based on. Really? It's Tiffany? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's based on Tiffany. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. I think that's, like, yeah, the... It's making fun of that. Because <laughs> she was also Canadian, I think. I'm, I'm sure she was. Or she is. I don't know. I don't know where she was. She's probably working at like a, like a Wetzel's Pretzels somewhere in Canada. 
<laughs> you know that used to be me up there. But she's like pointing to like the Easter bunny <laughs> that their kids are taking pictures with. <laughs> that used uh, to be me. Now we're gonna get sued by Tiffany. <laughs> <sighs> uh, if Tiffany had money to sue people, I would be surprised. I'm. I think she's still performing at the Mall of America. It's a living, as they, the Triceratops in the Flintstones would say. It's a living. So that's a song that I was thinking of. I think it's kind of a perfect song because they're finally alone, and they can kind of like just have the nice little dance. Though for some reason, it's a boppy '80s song. Percy doesn't uh, doesn't say what he's thinking because he's nervous because he's a nervous little fourteen year old. Well, it's either that. There's two ways of looking at this because I was thinking about this and thinking about like kids romance versus adult romance, and how this is for the first time these this is how kids like feel for the first time is like the big thing is the dance before kissing or anything else is really like you go into a dance. This is always like the stereotypical thing of you go to the dance and you look into each other's eyes and then you know you fall in love rather than like. Most adult romance is like, hey, you want to get pizza? And I already got it. Beer's in the fridge? Heck yeah, I love you. There's like different types of, you know, relationships. And I kind of like that they show kind of the, I like to call it the Hollywood romance almost, of like the kids at the dance. Very much like Stranger Things. That's actually a maybe a good or bad example. Something like that of having something personal. Personally, I didn't go to prom, so I never had that experience. So who knows? And that kind of leads us to uh, the last part of this, B. And what is the name of the next chapter? Not only is it the next chapter, it is the final chapter. Do 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 do. Yep. <laughs> I think we're alone now. Um, chapter twenty is I get a new enemy for Christmas. Oh, great! Yay! Right? Remember, it's Christmas time. Remember when we started this? It was Christmas time, <laughs> and it's still Christmas there because it's been five days. Yeah, he gets a new enemy. I don't know who that could be. A uh, Kronos is technically his, already his enemy, so I don't know. I don't know. But he gets a new enemy, B. Oh, wait, wait. I have a guess, actually. What's your guess? Is it, like, not a real... Okay, you're obviously... You can't answer me. So this is hypothetical. I mean, I can answer you. I don't know how well I'm going to answer you, but you can say something. <sighs> My guess is that he returns home for Christmas with his mom, and it's, like, that guy that he saw briefly in the um in the iris message and it's like the awkward guy that she was dating and then he's like i hate this guy and that's his new enemy for christmas like that's like because they're messing with us they're like ah you think it's going to be a real enemy but it's actually this kind of annoying studious guy that his mom met at college well what i'll say about this b is that look at the first book and how that book ends Look how the second book and how that ends. It's always a, there's always that twist. It's like that. I, I almost want to call it like an R.L. Steinian twist. Yeah, well, I guess like the first book ends with Luke just being like, "Ha ha, I'm evil." Actually, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He laughs just like that. <laughs> well, he can't now because he's like real broken. I just imagine he has like a robot voice now. Ha 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 ha. Ha ha. Yeah, I'm like, I'm picturing like him just being just kind of like ground meat in a jar with googly eyes. And then Annabeth is holding it, being like, this is my boyfriend and we're working <laughs> through it together. <laughs> For some reason, I'm thinking like his head's in a jar, like, like Futurama. But do you have no idea who this enemy could possibly be? I mean, that like, I was like guessing that guy, but I don't know if that's. Like, a good guess. I just... I don't know. I don't know who else... It could be, like, a new enemy. I get a new enemy for Christmas. Like, he has a lot of current enemies. Yeah. So, I mean, like, Atlas is his enemy, and Luke, and... Well, it's, he's getting a new enemy. It doesn't mean it could be a new character throughout this adventure. It could be someone from the past. It could be someone from the future. All I know is that you get a new enemy. I can't... I, like, don't know. I don't know. It could be any number of people. I'm I'm just hearing a lot of people screaming at their podcasting machines right now, but it's it's okay. That I'm not making a good guess. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, not that you're not making a good guess. You might actually be right, or you may actually be wrong. I'm never going to tell you until next week. We'll never know. Well, we'll know next week. Join us next week on the last chapter of this book. Um, and then we're moving on to another book. Amazing. So let's go to emails right now. We did get an email from Kaylee. 
Hi, Zach and B. I'm super excited to be able to send this email. I've been wanting to send out one, but had to wait until after you finish Sea of Monsters to write this. And I'm pretty sure you're almost done with the Titan's Curse at the moment. So hopefully I won't be spoiling anything from that book. Warning, this will be very long because I have a lot to say, but I'll try to stay on topic. Firstly, I love this podcast. I especially love how you go into detail that you notice and you've sparked me to want to reread these book series. Then I remember I'm a business student, don't have the time to read them. I've been trying to read Dracula for the last part of a good year. I enjoy the Harry Potter references, but my favorite is the Star Wars references. Star Wars is my favorite franchise, and it's something that I know the lore about to a great degree. Though there is something I want to respond to. For one of your earliest episode, you were talking about the Chronicles of Narnia and Susan at the end, and I just cringed at your comment because you made out the same assumption that most people do without actually taking Christian teaching into context of what it stated. Susan was not delegated to hell, that's in quotation marks, uh, because of the fashion. Susan decided that she was no longer wanted to think about Narnia as an actual place because she couldn't stand not being able to go back. So she was focused on herself and her personal enjoyment, i.e. fashion makeup boys, something that is fine in moderation. This is an allegory of something turning away from Christ and following on their own self-gratification. Because of this, she was not with her family when they were all killed in the train derailment. Yeah, that is the thing Spoilers. that happens. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I forgot about that. It's a real dark series, you guys. <laughs> Though there are records of C.S. Lewis stating that he wanted to finish Susan's story and give her a way back to Narnia, wipes sweat away and takes a deep breath. B, how would you like to respond to this? Okay, so, I mean, this is, like, definitely a debate among people, but I don't think that there's necessarily, like, a right way or a wrong way to interpret it. It's sort of, like, up to you. A lot of people think that regardless of what C.S. Lewis was doing there, it was kind of misogynistic and weird. They go to heaven, basically, Narnia heaven, and then she doesn't, and it's like, yes, she's, it's self-gratification, but, like, the way that it's framed is very much, like, these frivolous female things that she likes, and also, like, sexuality is thrown into that, too, and they kind of condemn her for that. It's just kind of, like, a very weird, uptight, draconian way to, like, look at a person's life. And yes, she does kind of turn away from Narnia herself, but just, like, she's moralized in a very, frankly, kind of misogynistic way. Doesn't super sit well with me. Like, a lot of children's lit scholars would probably agree with me there. Uh, Neil Gaiman wrote a short story about it called The Problem of Susan. If you want to read that, uh, that's sort of his interpretation on the whole thing. It's not, like, a super popular thing that he did (laughs) to Susan, is what I'm saying. So, like, I get that it's sort of, like, supposed to be through, like, a Christian theology lens. That's also not famously known for being great towards women. So, eh. It, again, it's, like, it's up to you. Like, yeah, she she kind of turns away from Narnia, but it's... It, I'm not a fan. Personally, I think it's, like, not a really great look. And maybe when it was written, it wasn't as much of a weird thing because it was, like, normal to say that those kinds of things were frivolous. But just, like, the way that it's written, to me personally, feels pretty misogynistic and strange. Um, we disagree, I guess. Um, but again, there's some scholars who would agree with you. So it's kind of like, it's an argument that will go on forever because it's a fictional book and people will always argue about what those things mean. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to read a little more of this. I'm going to try to condense a little bit because we do have a few more. I apologize for this, Kaylee, but we do have a lot of other people. Sorry if you feel like alienated by disagreeing with me. <laughs> I feel bad, but like that's how I feel. Anyway, so I wanted to help answer some things you were asking questions about, wondering about in the terms of PGA. I wrote the answer to each question where I heard them, so they may already have been answered um, so kind of like, I'll just like summarize a couple of these B. Uh, so the reason why the mist seems kind of deus ex machina is actually for legit reason. Humans don't remember facts. As soon as something happens, our minds begin to change memories. This is why the older you get, the harder it is to tell what is like a childhood memory and what isn't. We also like to rationalize things. Think of the mist like a fog. It distorts vision and memories for mortals. Then Thalia uses it to manipulate mortals and kind of like... She is making artificial fog artificial, but still difficult to see through. The reason for the mist affects demigods is because, well, they are half god, they are still half mortal, and the most part of them is not aware of their godly blood. Then while they're aware of weird things happen, they don't really be able to see through the mist fully. 
we see this with Percy in The Lightning Thief. As time goes by, they gr- um, he grows and becomes more aware of gods and monsters and less time in the mortal world. The stronger his sight becomes, but they are also still mortal and they can still be susceptible. When someone is going to the afterlife, they cannot just return. Many of these myths are about people trying and uh, bold uh, to bring back a loved one and failing. Sally wasn't dead. She was basically teleported by Hades, but kept by him as a collective against Percy. She didn't return from the dead. If she was dead, I doubt Percy would have been able to get her back. So it's not just Percy who couldn't fly. If Hades had any children, then they wouldn't be able to fly parallel. If Zeus' children had to travel the world and didn't want to do any of the sort of sea travel, the big three are all super territorial. It would not allow for one of their brother's children to have domain except for under particular circumstances. That's all I have to say about the books at the moment, but I wanted to tell you my favorite characters in fiction. I'm going to kind of st- summarize just the the list because, we, like I said before, we do have a couple uh, other emails. So we have – I'm going to be butchering names because some of these are from animes, and I apologize already because some of them I haven't watched. Uh, Kikyo Morigami or Kaiko. Kaiko, K-Y-O-K-O, Mogami. I don't know. I, it's from Skip Beat. I haven't watched Skip Beat. We have Wonder Woman. We have Leia Organa. I don't know what how to pronounce this one. Iru H A H I R U. I apologize because ja- I don't speak Japanese, so I don't know how to pronounce things. This is like Creon and Chiron to me. And lastly, we have Sailor Moon. I really love your podcast, and I'm looking forward to you finishing the series. If you do want to continue with the other series, then may you want to look into doing multiple chapters at a time instead of just one to help cut down how long it takes. But that would be up to you. Keep up the good work and keep staying mortal. Kaylee the Dragon. P.S. Check out this Princess Tutu AMV. I watched it. It's actually pretty good. Good job, Kaylee. Yeah, I don't know how long the other series are. Maybe we might end up doing a couple chapters at a time depending on how super long they are. I don't know exactly. Um... I guess that would be, I don't know, we might come to some sort of consensus about that once we... I have to, like, look at it first before we we, we make that decision, because it's, like, it's weird and wacky, because I remember them being kind of long, but also kind of short, but we'll figure that out once we get to that bridge so we can burn it while yeah. we're... We still have oh, we a got, couple... We got, um, like, six years left before we actually get to the major problems. Yeah, we still have a couple books left in this series, so we're gonna take care of these. Yeah, so we're... <laughs> we're probably going to like stick with the one chapter a week thing for this series anyway. So we have several months ahead of us. B, could you read the next message, please? Email that says response, insert Lenny face. Isn't that like the sort of little weird smiley face emoji? Anyway. For some reason, when I saw this email, I thought it said insert Lemmy face, like Lemmy from Motorhead. And I'm like, RIP Lemmy. No, I don't think well, that's what it is. But anyway. <laughs> Hi, Zach and B. I'm one of your thousands of fans. Wow, that sounds crazy when you hear someone say that. And you probably don't know me, but thanks for the fun you've given me. But you give me inspiration for school and projects. I do, so thanks. Also, I've sent an email before. I don't know if you've read it or not, but yeah, thanks. We may have read it. We we read most of the emails we get, so. So we read all of our emails, or at least if, if they're not read on the show, we at least see them, because, yeah. But. If you ask us, we'll read it. So we probably read it. I don't know when. We've gotten a lot of emails, but you could listen to every episode and try to find it. Or sometimes if we miss an email, sometimes we don't realize because we do get a lot. Sometimes Um, they come in late and then sometimes the way that we have our stuff, like people actually, someone while we're recording our show sent us an email. So it depends on like the the time. Yeah. And then like we think we already did it and then we'll miss that one. Like that's the only time we won't read it is if we forget basically, but we try to read all of them. Thank you for that nice, nice email. Um, should I say their name? First name, I guess? Yeah, you can say first name. Yeah, so from William. Thank you, William. That was very nice. So we do have another email from Viba. Since everyone seems to introduce themselves by age and country, then I will do the same. Hi, I'm Vibe, pronounced something like VB or Viba. I'm sorry. I'm just going to call you Vibe just for the context of this. I'm 21 from Denmark. I really enjoy listening to your podcast, cycling to and from work. Let me just say that you two have great voices. Like B has a really nice, soothing voice. And Zach has this fun, always happy sounding voice. So you uh, voices sound really compliment each other. <laughs> oh, I think this person follows me on Twitter. 
because oh, I, I got remember a, I saw that like they tweeted. I got a tweet us, yeah. that was like, "You have a good, you have a soothing voice." I was like, "Thank you. <laughs> it's very nice." I wanted to tell you that I think it works really well the way you two are doing your episodes so far. I like the prediction B has, and that you talk and answer questions. In the end, very nice. You guys are just all around nice people. Smiley face. Also love how analytical you can be about the smallest things. It's great, and I love listening. So enjoy your day and look forward to my favorite character, Redacted, here. Even though it's going to take a while for you to get to the best part of Heroes of Olympus. Thanks, Vibe. B, do you want to read the next email? Uh, Yep. Uh, From Alex. Who says, hey guys, this is Alex, a.k.a. the Book Fair Review Guy. <laughs> Just wanted to start off this message by saying I got super jealous of B when they mentioned the Simpsons game was at their book fair. The coolest thing I got that wasn't a book was either one of those pens that had four different colors of ink. Those were cool. Or a poster of a fighter jet. Okay, the poster was pretty cool. Oh, uh, yeah. I just wanted to hear back about the Patreon. It's gone quiet in the past and understand y'all have been super busy but i just want to ask i'm a ten dollar patron super excited for more content but i'm willing to be patient anyways love hearing y'all talk every week and look forward to the next 20 years of podcast sincerely alex what are you talking about 20 years we've been doing this for about 30 yeah we still have a, a list of books we want to get to for the for the patreon um yes so to answer this uh, and be very frankly we have gotten emails uh we've been a little busy i'm actually working on getting the Ready Player One review out. I'm, I apologize for that. I'm in between a move and then in between jobs and all these things. It's not like I don't want to do stuff and be yeah. over here. As had- basically, as soon as I'm like recovered from surgery, I'm probably going to also start sending out uh, pins to anybody who is a $10 p- patron. So, like, we, we understand like you're concerned, and it's not like we're trying to like scam you and take all your money. Like, there's actually been reasons preventing us from recording because we're not trying to, like, scam you out of your money. Like, we're not doing things like that. Like, the main reason why it's taking us so long to do all this stuff is we have to actually read the book and then plan out a time because we both now have jobs and recovering from surgery. So we have to find, like, the times that work for us between the week. And we still have that list, right, of all sorts of different books that we want to read next. Um, Not sure what we're going to do yet. Like we're we got some stuff coming up. Like trust us, we we'll, we're gonna we're gonna figure it out. It's not like we're not doing that. We we promise to do. Just be uh, pretty much just be stay tuned. So we did get some iTunes reviews. The first one says ten out of ten would camp half blood again. This is a really entertaining podcast for lovers of Percy Jackson universe. As a lover of Riordan, you don't want to know how many copies I have. This is a real trip down memory lane with some new friends. I highly recommend it for anyone looking for a good PGO pod. Oh, thank you. What a nice, nice review. Uh, B, do you want to read the next one? From Madeline204, who says, I thoroughly enjoy this podcast. The hosts appreciate the books, but are not afraid to criticize and dissect them. And it's really funny to hear B constantly guessing things and Zach not telling them anything, reading the books at a slower pace. Then most helps them dive deeper into the story and pick up on things I didn't notice my first reading. My only complaint is that I have to wait a week between episodes. That's my only complaint, too. It's reading is very difficult to do that. Um, yeah, it's I I wish I kind of knew what was happening most of the time, but I do this for you guys. Don't you love it when that's the major complaint? I wish there were more episodes. Yeah. I mean, if we did more than an episode a week, I think I would go crazy because I literally do not have enough time in the day. But I... Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate you listening every week. Thinking about the, like doing an episode more than a week is think of it as the equivalent of the Fairly Odd Parents, where Timmy wishes that Christmas was every day. Like eventually, like, it would just like slow down to a trickle. Yeah, exactly. Just learn to appreciate appreciate the the joys of of two friends talking about books. So we have another iTunes review, and it says episode forty nine, and it's four stars. I've been listening to this podcast for the past few weeks since I found it, and I'm still trying to catch up. I love hearing about Rosie and Pfeffernoos. Did I spell that correctly? Yes. You did, actually. You did, even with the um, umlaut over the U. That's very impressive. Oopla. Hoopla. Yeah. Hoopla. And I love all your book references. Sadly, there's something that you say that make me cringe. B, I'm not sure you really understand the meaning behind Susan leaving behind Narnia. She wasn't kicked out or abandoned. Oh, jeez. 
Here we go. <laughs> and it kind of hurts to hear you keep repeating the idea. I like to think that this is a different person who's also mad about that. I mean, <laughs> it's possible, B. There's, it... I think it's the same person who emailed us, but that would be really funny if there's like a contingent of Narnia fans who are like, no. Thank God we're not a Narnia podcast. Oh, Yeah, well, yeah, I would not want to be a Narnia podcast. <laughs> not to say that there isn't anything wrong with the Chronicles of Narnia. They're all fine books. It's just they're not uh, our taste, really. Zach, well, I do understand there's a lot of people that don't seem to like the prequels. I do, though. Nowhere near as much as the original trilogy. Only bad dialogue is a thing. You mentioned having them spawn skeletons. Or in Star Wars, why wouldn't they spawn... Why would they spam clothes and, yikes, have them spam the creation of human beings who are born and bred for only fighting and dying for the government's war? I know you're not the type of person that actually believes in this, but that's how it came across. I really love your podcast and hope you can keep reading the series and and keep staying mortal. So I had to go back and actually listen to that episode and like talk about like the context we're talking about this. And the way that I'm going to talk about this right now is that there's a difference between taking things out of context and taking things as like basically common sense. Because the way I was talking about it is, is that why doesn't they just keep cloning people in the idea of it being like logic within the universe, not kind of like my moral understanding of what I want in Star Wars. Like what you think should happen. Yeah. <laughs> like that would be beneficial to him. You're not like on his side. <laughs> No, that's exactly it. So the way in the context of it is, is like, I'm not kind of talking about eugenics almost. I'm talking about like <laughs> in the concept Jeez. of Star Wars, like why doesn't the evil empire keep cloning people and like have an infinite source of people? Like that sounds like great in Star Wars. We're also talking about the same series where we have space wizards and laser swords. Yeah, that's true. It's one of those things where you can easily take things out of context and kind of apply it rather than having it like, I might be saying something, but my moral principles are completely different. Because I'm looking at kind of like cheesing the book almost, kind of like cheesing a game, like finding exploits and glitches. It's the exact same way. Like, like it's like the, I, I call it like the genie scenario of like, why don't you wish for more wishes? Oh, you can't do that. Okay, then I wish for more genies. <laughs> the exact same principle. That's kind of what we do is try to find plot holes and things, even though, I mean, everything has plot holes probably, if you look closely enough. Yeah, and that's like, there's nothing wrong with like looking and dissecting plot holes because even in Star Wars, there's a bunch of plot holes that make no sense. And I'm sure they talk about clone armies in like one of the books. I'm sure they had the same Senate meeting where they banned clone armies the same day they banned R2 units from being able to use jetpacks. <laughs> I think that was like, what, 19 BBY? I don't know my star dates all that well in Star Wars. I'm just sitting here, like, completely unaware of how Star Wars works, being like, are you winning, son? I don't, yeah. I This weekend has really been a ride for me because I um don't watch any of the Marvel movies or Game of Thrones. So, like, everyone on Twitter is like, Winterfell. And I'm like, I don't understand anything about these properties but i hope you're having fun personally i like to call this all like water cooler pop culture like if you aren't like in the know it's kind of like oh you're, you're missing out on almost like a like a cultural event for nerds yeah it's not fun <laughs> i mean like i don't i have no interest in being involved in either of those properties like they're not something that's that i'm into but then like when i'm on twitter and i'm like i don't know what people are talking about also star wars actually because the star wars celebration thing happened pretty recently and also like the the trailer came out i like don't know what's happening <laughs> like i'm happy for you i guess are you happy are you sad the game of thrones people seem sad <laughs> well it's a mixed opinion because you the funny thing is the way we were going to record this was yesterday which would have been sunday so it would have been post endgame pre battle of winterfell but now it's just post endgame post battle of winterfell and i'm just a broken individual inside you're just a broken shell of a man and i'm a, just a tiny confused little bumblebee <laughs> but thank you so much for that lovely review i mean we're not trying to like fight you in any of this stuff but like when people propose things we do you know we do have our own opinions when it comes to the matter and we will we will address it if someone calls us out on stuff. Yeah, again, if you're a lot of people have different opinions than me about the the Susan thing, which is like Well, yeah, no, and we were and we respect people's opinions. If you want to say something, this is your platform that you could talk about it. We totally will give you your time 
and we will talk about it and then we'll have our rebuttal. Uh, so B, did we get any more iTunes reviews? We sure did. We got a couple. Um, we got one from Obi Gwen Kenobi, which is funny. Um, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> Help me, Obi Gwen Kenobi. I think that's a weak, winky emoji. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell on my desktop. I'm so lucky I found this podcast. I love all the tangents Zach and B go on, and it really helps me see literature in a new light. Because of this podcast, I analyze <laughs> anything and everything I read to death, which is a good thing, I promise. That's funny. That's a great review. Oh, no. Now that I've like started really getting into like children's literature and YA, I'm like analyzing things more now. And it's kind of like ruined goosebumps for me, but though it's funny because I was just uh, listening to R.L. Satan's masterclass and he doesn't believe in like like allegories or metaphors and all that stuff. I'm like, oh, wait. Did you see that tweet that was like, if I start a podcast about all the hot dads on the Goosebumps TV show, would you guys listen? <laughs> so I can't remember the hot dads of Goosebumps, but I can remember all like the, the hot mobs of Goosebumps with like the 90s mom jeans and like the flannel. Oh, there's so many mom jeans. Do you know what? I I feel like the mom from Halloween Town is the most 90s mom. Like, she just is, like, the paragon of what a 90s mom is. Isn't she just wearing all jean? She's wearing, she's wearing a Canadian tuxedo, for sure. She's wearing the full denim ensemble. Well, that makes sense because uh, also Goosebumps was filmed mostly in Canada. So, yeah. 90s Canada is an aesthetic. Yeah, pretty much everything's filmed in Canada nowadays. Um, anyway, thank you for your lovely review. <laughs> yes, very much appreciated. I had to get in my, uh, my Halloween Town reference of the episode. <laughs> so we do have another uh, iTunes review from Cameron. I love your podcast and I'm so excited for more content. My only complaint is that you have too few, like, different episodes other than chapter reviews. So if you could fix that this, for this podcast, that'd be perfect. P.S. Read this on the podcast. Thanks, smiley face. We just did it. All right. We succeeded. Hold on, wait. You have too few, like, different episodes other than that chapter. Wait, I don't understand what this is saying. <laughs> I think it's what we're trying to say is, like, our Matilda review, our Holes review, like, movie review, like, small, like, bonus episodes that we have. Um, I think they just want more of them, which, you know, we're working on. It's just we've been so busy to, to find extra time because we, we have to find time to even record our show recently. Like, putting, like, almost two hours out of our day can be a little hectic at times but we we love doing it okay yeah i see they're saying that we don't have yeah if you're also if you're subscribed to the patreon you'll get those bonus episodes sooner um so as soon as the ready player one one is out but um i think that kind of wraps up this episode for this week we're on the penultimate chapter of the titan's curse i can't believe we're actually getting through book three my favorite book out of all these we're almost at christmas you guys <laughs> here almost at may in the real world. The next book is going to be about, like, Percy Jackson on Easter. We just missed it. Yeah. Um, I hope it's a summertime book because it's almost actually summer. <laughs> well, by the time we finish, it'll be past summer. It'll be, like, October. <laughs> That's how it works. Uh, but, B, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at B. Kelly Gorman, and you can find me on tumblr at twinpoetry.tumblr.com if you want to find me you can find me on twitter at suda41 that's s-u-d-a-4-1 if you want to email our show and or tweet at us you can tweet at us at halfblood underscore radio and you can email us at radio camp halfblood at gmail.com we also have a patreon patreon slash radio camp halfblood we also have t-shirts available at t public so just look for that on radio camp halfblood and you'll be able to find it uh, we have some wonderful things coming up we're so excited. New pins, new you, new me. It's I'm about to say it's it's past Easter. For some reason, now that I'm in the Christmas environment, I'm, like, I'm so excited for the new year. I'm like, wait, that's totally wrong. We've been in 2019 for, for a couple while, months yeah. now. Well, B, I think that's it. I'm Zach. I'm B. And keep staying mortal. Bye. See you guys. <laughs>